Hello everyone and welcome back to another day of our 30 day biology study challenge. Today is day 27, we're going to be talking about energy and ecosystems. Be sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the days of our 30 day study challenge and make sure to stay tuned for the entirety of this video because at the end we're going to be doing some practice problems to really help you lock in that knowledge. Let's get started. Now we know that all organisms need energy to survive, to maintain their structures, to grow, to reproduce, but different organisms have different ways of obtaining or harnessing that energy. So a lot of what we talk about when we talk about energy and ecosystems is how the energy can flow through ecosystems in different ways. Now we'll also be talking about how matter can flow through ecosystems and that's what food chains and food webs can show us is the flow of matter and energy between different organisms in an ecosystem. And we're going to begin to see how all organisms are interconnected and how for example a change in the number of producers in a particular ecosystem can affect the consumers at the secondary tertiary, even quaternary consumer level. Let's take a closer look. Remember, life is organized. It's one of our characteristics of life. We know that a group of organisms of one species in one location is a population, and populations can be categorized by functions that they serve. Right here, we're looking at a food web. Organisms are characterized in different trophic levels or energy levels depending on where they feed and what they consume. Producers can generate their own food, usually from sunlight energy, sometimes chemical energy as well. Consumers consume the producers and decomposers break down organic material from other organisms. A food chain shows one pathway of energy flow. A food web, like you see here, can show the interconnectedness of many food chains within a particular ecosystem. Keep in mind that on a food web, the arrows always point towards the consumer or the organism that is doing the eating. So here we have the rabbit arrow pointing towards the cougar or mountain lion, which means the rabbit is getting eaten by the cougar or mountain lion. He is doing the eating, so the arrow points into his belly. Important word here is an autotroph, also known as a producer, but these are organisms that can make their own food or are able to form their own organic molecules for food. Plants are autotrophic. Heterotrophs are organisms that must consume other organic compounds for food, and that means consuming other organisms. Heterotrophs are consumers. For example, humans are able to obtain nutrients by consuming other organisms or the products of other organisms. This is a typical trophic or energy pyramid that you might see. We have our producers or our autotrophs at the bottom. These are organisms that are going to get energy from the sun through chemical processes, photosynthesis. And then on the next level up, those are the primary consumers, the organisms that consume them. The next level up, we have the secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and quaternary consumers. There's different types of pyramids too, like pyramids of biomass and pyramids of numbers. But here, what we're looking at are these different trophic levels or levels that that organisms feed at. And we want to keep in mind that at every level, we have a significant amount of energy lost. So it is inefficient. We have about a 90% energy lost every single time we go up a trophic level. So it's more efficient uh, energy wise to consume at lower trophic levels, but only about 10% of that energy is retained every time you go up a trophic level. I want to go back to talk about how all energy on earth is really supported by the sun. And of course, all matter here on earth is here to stay and the atoms and molecules that we interact with and make up our bodies are the same atoms and molecules that were here hundreds of thousands of years ago. Think about how carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen all combine and recombine together and are passed through different food and matter systems. But analyzing the flow of energy and the cycling of matter within an ecosystem is an important part of biology. So this diagram is something that you might want to consider. These plants are going to use carbon from the atmosphere to undergo photosynthesis and create glucose and oxygen, which are our ingredients for respiration. But if we think about if more snails are added to this container, what effect is it going to have on the plants in the container? Eventually, if we add more snails, we would see more carbon dioxide and more carbon dioxide would lead to more plant growth because the plants could take in more carbon dioxide to perform more photosynthesis. Now, there are lots of ways that matter and energy are cycled throughout the planet. The carbon cycle is one example of that, and there's lots of different processes where carbon, that element, is converted or passed between different organisms or between organisms and the environment. So from the air, Plants and other things like phytoplankton in the water can take in carbon as carbon dioxide and use that in the process of converting sunlight energy into organic compounds. So the carbon dioxide in the air goes directly into those organic compounds or things like glucose. And then all living things perform respiration. But in the process of respiration, we use that glucose to generate ATP, which is another molecule organisms use for energy. So that process is respiration. So if we follow the path of carbon here, we say that carbon can come from the atmosphere into photosynthetic organisms like trees and then can be consumed by other organisms 
systems. So when so when animals eat plants, they're taking in carbon that way, and then they're exhaling carbon dioxide after the process of respiration. Now, not all the carbon leaves their bodies. Eventually, they will die, and after death, the carbon can be returned to the environment through the help of decomposers who will break down the carbon in dead organisms' bodies, and that decomposition process will release carbon either back into the soil or back into the atmosphere. Another way carbon can enter the atmosphere is by is through combustion. So the combustion of fossil fuels also releases lots of carbon into the atmosphere. And when there's lots of carbon in the atmosphere, it actually can be taken up by the waters in the ocean. And sometimes we have lots of carbon going into oceans, and that carbon actually turns into carbonic acid in solution in water, which leads to a lots of ocean acidification. So the more carbon in the atmosphere, the more the oceans can take in and the more acidic the oceans get, which is not always great for the ecosystems there. All right, it's time for some practice. Now, as we go through these practice problems, feel free to mute me, pause me, go at your own pace, whatever it is you need to do. I'm going to go over the question, pause, and then reveal the answer. Here we go. Most food chains start with a A, primary consumer, B, secondary consumer, C, decomposer, or D, producer. Think about it. Correct answer is producer. I hope I didn't trick you with putting primary consumer first, but most food chains do start with a producer who is most likely harnessing energy from the sun. When the organisms from one trophic level are consumed by organisms from the next trophic level, energy is A, gained, B, lost, C, conserved equally, or D, destroyed. Think about it. Correct answer is B, lost. Remember, every time you go up a trophic level, a significant amount of energy is lost. It's more efficient to consume at lower levels of an energy pyramid. In an ecosystem, where do the atoms of elements like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen cycle? A, inside living things only, B, inside and out of living things, or C, outside of living things only? Think about it. Correct answer is B, inside and out of living things. Hopefully this was a pretty easy one for you, especially since we started to talk about some of those cycles in this video. All right, last up. This is a simplified image of a grassland ecosystem. Where does energy in this ecosystem originally come from? A, flowers, B, the sun, C, the air, or D, the bees. Think about it. Correct answer is be the sun. Now most food chains and food webs rely on the sun as the ultimate source of energy on planet earth. Now we do have other food chains like ones involving deep sea bacteria that rely on chemosynthesis in order to harness energy, but the majority of food webs and food chains that we'll encounter, especially the ones on land, are going to be powered by the sun. All right, be sure to stay tuned for day 28. Tomorrow we're going to be talking a little bit more about the interactions between some of these organisms in our video on populations and communities. Thank Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.